Okay, thanks, Rich, and uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so I have been interested in uh, in high resolution modeling of thunderstorms, and I did my PhD work on microbursts where I looked at the subcloud environment, just taking cold blobs of air and smashing them together and seeing what kind of wind fields that provided. Uh, but in the early 2000s, I started working with Robert Wilhelmson when I was at the University of North Carolina, starting out as a, as a new faculty, and I started collaborating with him and started to do supercell simulations with the ICOMAS model, which was a descendant of the Clem Wilhelmson model. And uh, at one point, I went to a, an NCAR users, a WARF users uh, group meeting, and I met George Bryan, who is the author of the CM1 model, and it was already massively parallelized. Uh, it was already written with MPI, whereas the model I was using was a shared memory model. So I started using CM1, and the rest is history. So I'm a big NCAR booster, big NCSA booster, and the work that I'm doing here would simply not be possible without some very, uh, very generous and very intelligent people uh, helping out the community. So the scientific motivation for the work that I'm doing is that supercell thunderstorms, uh, they're the ones with rotating updrafts called mesocyclones. They typically form uh, in the most abundance in, the, say, the Great Plains of the United States. Uh, say in the spring months, you might see people chasing tornadoes in Oklahoma and Kansas and things like that. They produce the majority of the world's tornadoes. And more importantly, they produce the majority of the world's very strong tornadoes, those that are ranked F, EF4, EF5 on the enhanced Vegeta scale. If you think of storms like Joplin that you know, came through as an F5, EF5 tornado that destroyed a bunch of the town, killed a lot of people, El Reno, Oklahoma, uh, a couple of tornadoes there, one of which I'm simulating, um, one that killed a very uh, prominent storm chaser called Tim Samaras in 2013. So these, these storms are of great concern. They cause the, the vast majority of the damage and the fatalities, but they're also, we really don't understand what, how tornadoes work in supercell thunderstorms. We really don't. Um, the leading theories are, are sort of vague, and I believe the general conceptual models, uh, at least the work that I'm doing, is really calling into question some of the assumptions built into some of the conceptual models for how tornadoes work. So I would say that uh, organizations in the United States, such as the Storm Prediction Center, are very good at forecasting where the outbreaks are going to occur. You'll often see a, you know, a day two outlook, day one outlook, where are the supercells going to be? What's the probabilistic uh, characteristics? You know, what percentage of the storms are going to be tornadic? Things like that. But exactly what really matters is, you know, where are the tornadoes going to form? When are they going to form? And how strong are they going to be? And we really can't forecast that with any skill whatsoever. The National Weather Service in the United States has a false alarm rate of about 75% for forecasting tornadoes. That means for every three times the sirens go off out of four, there's no tornado. So you get the cry wolf phenomenon where people start to just get jaded and they don't pay attention to the warnings and things like that. So my hope is with the work that I'm doing that eventually it will lead to better and more targeted forecasts for, um, for tornadic supercells. It's just as important to say that this storm is not gonna produce a tornado as it is to say it's gonna be a weak one or a very strong one. So there's a whole lot of work that can be done in this area and I am a modeler. Um, I'm not a field meteorologist. Um, I really am one, I'm a very strange guy in that regard. I don't really chase storms. Um, when I was very young, five years old, in fact, my house got hit by lightning and it scared the crap out of me. I mean, I saw glowing wires and paneling and insulation on, you know, burning and all that stuff. And this is in Western Massachusetts in the early 1970s. And on October 3rd, 1979, there was an F4 tornado that went up the Connecticut River Valley it just basically lifted pretty close to where my house was. And this supercell produced also uh, downbursts and our house got hit by a downburst. And you know, there was damage and stuff. So I was exposed to severe weather as, a, as I was young and instead of making me fascinated by it, it kind of made me scared of it. So I just don't want to be in the vicinity of these storms. When I discovered in college that um, when I learned how to program, I really enjoy programming quite a bit, and I discovered that I could do programming and severe weather, and like, I'm there. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So anyway, um, I have had access to machines like the Blue Water Supercomputer um, that have made my work possible. So the problem with things like this, this is a pretty familiar issue, is that you're studying a phenomenon that's pretty small, but it's embedded within something much bigger. So um, you know, there's a lot of very small scale turbulent type flow that occurs in, in, in thunderstorms and traditionally modelers will re, won't resolve these things very well. 
So to give you just sort of an idea of the scale of this problem, um, this is a simulated radar reflectivity -ish, uh, uh, plot at 500 meters above ground. So this box right here is 21 kilometers by 21 kilometers. The full model domain that you can't see extends well beyond the screen here and is actually 112 kilometers on a side. Uh, but if you get down to the place where we're actually interested, and this is a four kilometer by four kilometer little box here, and there is your developing tornado. Okay, that's it right here. So you have to simulate the entire storm at very high resolution in order to capture things that are occurring at small scale. So this requires supercomputing resources. And um, it also requires uh, to understand tornadoes, in my opinion, you need to uh, save data very frequently. You need to sample your data very frequently because the air in tornadoes moves really fast. <laughs> it's a pretty obvious statement, right? Um, but uh, I've spent about a decade of my life working on just I.O. data compression and data management. I ended up writing my own file system just in order to uh, enable the kind of animations and the kind of science that you're going to see uh, later on in the talk. So I spent a lot of time not chasing storms but chasing bugs in code. So I use basically what you'd call a brute force approach. Um, I re got access to the Blue Waters computer, which it was kind of sad yesterday hearing about the Blue Waters being an old machine. Um, I love that machine, man. I really do. It's been very good to me. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunities I've had to use the machine. And I've gone out to, uh, to Sun River, Oregon several times with, uh, with Bill Kramer and, his, and the group there. And I've just been, have nothing but good things to say about NCSA. Uh, it's just been a wonderful experience for me. I still have quite a bit of time on the machine and the, the simulation you're gonna see here, which is without a doubt the biggest supercell simulation ever conducted, was done on Blue Waters a couple months ago. And you're gonna see some of this data that I haven't published yet, actually. Um, I have a paper in review that, about some of the things I'm gonna talk about here. So um, the simulation, uh, for, for those of you, like you're thinking in climate terms or whatnot, um, a quarter trillion grid points. Okay, so the, the, the actually, I forget exactly, it's like something like uh, 2400 by 2400 by 2000. Well, no, it's actually 10 meter resolution. So it's, yeah, 2100 by 20, 2100 by 2000 grid points. Um, 10 meter isotropic resolution, so I'm not using any stretched grid. I have used stretched grids in the past. This was one of these cases where I just wanted to throw all the resources I could at the storm. More importantly, if you think of this in terms of what's sometimes called a hero simulation, these hero simulations are often run and it's one and done. You know, you do the simulation, you do a few two-dimensional plots and you call it a day. I've saved about a quarter petabyte of ZFP compressed data and I'm gonna do some interesting science with this data for the next several years. I have a PhD student working on this. This is gonna be part of his PhD, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm a huge fan of lossy floating point compression. And I don't care who you are in the sciences, if you're a modeler, if you're a climate modeler, if you're a turbulence modeler, at some point you're going to have to start compressing your data if you're not already. And I know there's gonna be a huge pushback on this, but let me just say there's absolutely nothing inherently special about 32 bits of precision or 64 bits of precision. With lossy floating point compression, if you do it intelligently, you can compress based upon an, what's called an accuracy parameter. You can simply state, I require, say, 0 0.01 degrees Celsius of accuracy. Now tell your algorithm that, and it will compress data to make sure you obtain that level of accuracy or better throughout the whole data. I get compression rate, I just wrote, a, writing, again, I have a paper in review about this. I get compression ratios anywhere from 10 to 1 to 100 to 1, and you can't tell by looking at the visualizations. Now you might ask, well, what if you want to do post-processing? One of the things uh, Kelton Halbert, my grad student, is working on right now is, is writing GPU trajectory code that reads this LOFS compressed data that's ZFP compressed, and we do the typical Lagrangian parcel analysis we do in meteorology a lot where you follow the air around and you calculate things along the parcel, and we're, and we're gonna do derivatives and stuff. We're gonna be calculating things, and we're gonna see where the compression artifacts start showing up. So where, how much compression can we get away with? Because one way to think about it is in my case, I simply could not do the research I'm doing without compressing data. I'm essentially trading a bit of spatial accuracy for temporal, uh, or, or spatial resolution for temporal resolution. I'm saving data up to every single model time step in some of my simulations. Every time step, one sixth of a second in my 30 meter run. In this case, I'm saving data at 10 meter resolution every uh, 0 0.2 seconds, okay? So the, the time step of the model is 2 50ths of a second, 2 over 50, and I'm saving data every 2 over 10 seconds. 
So this is ridiculous, right? I mean, but you'll see why I do it in a second. So I spent a whole lot of time playing with compression. Um, now, this talk isn't really about, what this talk is really focused on is the use of an NCAR tool called Vapor that was developed by John Klein and his group out at NCAR, another one of my favorite organizations. Um, so I have to look at my data. This is a problem that um, really demands three-dimensional visualization to understand. Um, some of the traditional techniques in meteorology just don't work when you're trying to understand something that's highly nonlinear, highly three-dimensional, highly anisotropic. You know, you've got stuff going in X, Y, and Z. So visualization tools and specifically volume rendering is a huge part of what I do. So I spent a couple of weeks, I've been working with Vapor, the group, for oh, like a decade or so. Um, I'm on the steering committee. Uh, in December of last year, I went out for two weeks at NCAR, at the Mesa Lab, and worked with John and his group to sort of get their software, sort of guide their development towards the end of getting a new release out called Vapor 3, which is, uh, it's out there, you can download it, you can use it. It doesn't have all the functionality that it's going to have. For instance, the trajectory code and the, and the flow line code is still being developed, but it's uh, everything you're gonna see here was, used, was done with Vapor 3 software. And it's literally, without any hyperbole, playing an extremely important, meaningful role in my research in enabling discovery, new discovery on how tornadoes work. Some of the first discoveries I've made in my research have been using Vapor. Like, I just discovered this thing for the first time using that software. And <laughs> that was a pretty, that was a strong statement, I know, but I, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it happens, it happens. So uh, if you guys were, were interested, I put a tiny URL on this. Uh, there's a paper that, and this is published in the uh, Open, Open Access Journal Atmosphere, MDPI. By the way, open access journals are great. I'm starting to sort of get on this board here. Notice that this paper was received on 22 July, accepted 21 August, published 25 August. It's now open access. Anyone can download and look at it. Think about, think about the, uh, turnover, the turnaround time for other journals or the fact that it's behind a paywall for a year. Anyway, I don't want to get too down that road, but you can check this out if you want, and this will tell you all about Vapor 3. You'll see some of the research data that I've, uh, I'm on this paper mostly as, as a use case guy. So I'm the one who says, here's how I use the software. And that's what I'm gonna talk about for much of this talk. So um, the most important change for me for Vapor 2, if those of you have used Vapor version 2, you had to convert it into a format that was very specific. Um, you had to use tools that Vapor provided as binaries to convert your data, usually from NetCDF, into new kinds of NetCDF files that used wavelet compression, a very specific kind of compression. Um, my own workflow, I know I've spent a bunch of time talking about ZFP compression, but when I say it, my own personal workflow seems to always involve uncompressed full fidelity data, what I mean is within the context of the Vapor software. I never want to visually degrade my data, and that's what Vapor can do. But they do that because sometimes you want to look at a very huge data set and you don't necessarily need to, to look at every single pixel at full fidelity. So it will, it will, you can choose how much, um, how much compression that happens on the fly. But I, don't, I never use that functionality of Vapor. And I think the, the Vapor team really listened a lot to people's input. And um, the, most, the biggest change that's most important to me is uh, Vapor now will read CF compliant net CDF files. So CF compliant, those of you who are in climate, you know this, there's basically a bunch of metadata you want to stick in your net CDF files so that when you open them up, um, everything, all the units are right, you know, the software can understand it and plot your data, do whatever. So I have a tool that I've developed, again, it's in the paper that's in review, um, it's also submitted to the Atmosphere Journal. We'll take the LOFS data, which is what I call my data, which is HDF5 data compressed with ZFP, uh, you have several time layers, up to like hundreds of time layers in each file. I buffer them to, to memory as I write them from the model, so I'm using the, the core driver, if those of you are familiar with HDF5. So, you know, I could go on for, for a long time talking about I.O., performance, compression, and things like that, but uh, I'll, I'll have a paper on this shortly. But this is really the biggest thing for me has been just getting the data into the software is so much easier. It's remo removed that friction. So if you go to the new Vapor software and you import data, you see you can get NetCDF CF compliant data. Boom, that's you just open the files and it works. You'll also notice WARF ARW and MPAS. So these are models also uh, developed primarily at NCAR, especially MPAS. MPAS is, someday will probably replace WARF. But, um, so it can read that stuff natively, and that's really, really important to me. 
So I'm going to walk through a couple of things I've done here. Here, is, uh, here are some of the options you have when you open uh, the, the vapor menu. Like what kind of data do you want to plot? You can plot wind barbs or you know, uh, uh, vectors. You can uh, put images down. You can do contours. You can do ISIS surfaces. You can slice through three-dimensional data. You can simply plot two-dimensional data that's in your NetCDF file. So for instance, I say both uh, three-dimensional volumetric data and also statistical data that's uh, saved at different levels or just snapshot data, and it will just pull that data right out. You can do volume rendering and you can look at your mesh. So here is an example of me selecting data from one of my NetCDF files. I've got a bunch of uh, two-dimensional data that I can choose from. I'm going to choose surface vorticity maximum. That's going to show the trace of vor vortices in my simulation data. And this is that four kilometer by four kilometer box. I'm going to adjust the opacity to make things a little more clear. And I'm going to kind of tighten it up a little bit and rotate the box, kind of get it to where I want to be. And that's like how I start to use the software. Bang. I just want to get my context. Where am I? You know, these are all these little vortex paths that are coming together that are going to uh, form a tornado. So I'm also going to walk through how I would look at three-dimensional volume data. So I want to plot the cloud. So I choose, I love volume rendering, so I choose the volume rendering option. Um, I'm going to change the color map right away. I'm going to choose the, the, the cloud variable, and I'm going to make the cloud look like a cloud. So it's not going to be blue and red. It's going to be white and gray. So I choose the left, uh, the left color is going to be sort of gray. Here I am just doing it live so you can kind of see how, how you might do the same thing. I'm going to choose the other side of the color map, also going to make it kind of gray. Um, you could, of course, save your own color map and just read it right in, but I just wanted to show this the typical workflow for myself. Now I'm going to sort of choose the opacity curve really quick, so I'm going to cut off data that's really small and sort of blend it in. And then I turn it on, and there's the cloud. Um, I'm going to rotate the box a little bit, and I'm not satisfied with the way that cloud looks, so I'm going to look at the lighting parameters and sort of sharpen it up and look at more, make it look more menacing and basically pull out the contrast and things like that. And, and there it is. Now, here is me doing something that actually is more publishable. So this is more like an ISIS surface, but this is volume rendering. And here is the tornado shortly after it formed. These are the paths of, of this is actually vorticity maxima, but you can think of this as the paths of vortices. One of the things my research is showing is that tornadoes sort of form by aggregating vorticity. You have vortices that sort of come together. But there's also a larger scale process going on where you reach a tipping point, and I think this has to do more with the pressure drop in the mesocyclone, that vortices that are sort of moving sort of towards the rear of the storm just stop moving and start piling up. Um, and this is really a, pretty much a brand new hypothesis for how tornadoes form. This really hasn't been seen before. And part of it is it's because of the super high resolution uh, data that I'm, or simulations that I'm doing. So I love volume rendering. Um, I like to be able to see both low values and high values. So here is like the opacity curve. You see this little bump here on the short side. So that's giving you the cloudy sort of, of diffuse vorticity. And then I kind of bring it up and you're seeing all the, the larger vortices. So here's that color map uh, a little closer. So I spent a lot of time working in this box here. You can choose your min and max, your color map. You can drop in new color points, new opacity points. So this little peak here in the left is what's giving you the diffuse low vorticity. Then I don't show anything. And then I'm showing, shorting the higher values, which tend to be actual vortices. Um, so displaying a, a wide dynamic range is something that I find important. And if you notice, and it would look better if the light's down, but you notice how it sort of, you can see the vortices better. Well, that's because I, the peak of that first little, uh, that little jump there on the left has been brought down a little bit. So you can do all sorts of things. Um, the idea is to see what's going on in your data. And here's another real nice image that shows both diffuse vorticity. You see these little hairpin vortices that are kind of coming into the storm here. This is the developing tornado. This is a vortex that's going to merge with that developing tornado. And this is actually an anticyclonic vortex. All these vortices are actually surrounded by horizontal vortices. And it's just vortices all the way down. It's really kind of crazy. Um, so for the next, um, oh, okay, and there's also uh, just good old lysis surfaces if you prefer. I'm not a big fan, but in this case, I'm looking at both uh, the three-dimensional vorticity shaded by the vertical components. So I can see uh, blue vortices are, are anticyclonic, they're rot rotating clockwise, and the red and yellows and such are, are cyclonic, the ones that are rotating counterclockwise that are the, the, the direction that the tornado ultimately does uh, rotate. Um, so, and just to compare again, notice how the difference here is now you can really see the, the diffuse vorticity and the, the vortices with volume rendering. So I, I tend to prefer volume rendering over, over uh, ISO services. So the next segment here is just going to be movies. Um, I did this by saving a series of NetCDF files and then creating uh, movies by using FFmpeg. Um, again, if the lights were a little lower, you could see this better, but I'll post this talk on my website afterwards, you can see this. But you see sort of what's going on here. This is uh, vortices start to form near the ground, 
and they sort of start to come together, this is going to become the tornado. Uh, the path that the vortices are taking starts to bend towards their left. So, and you'll notice this, this, this thing going over here to the right is sort of sweeping up and around the developing tornado. This is something uh, we've identified as, we call it a streamwise vorticity current, or at least it looks like that in our lower resolution simulations. We haven't looked at this enough yet. Um, it helps to enable the tornado, essentially. Um, now you'll see the tornado is getting wider. You can see it's a multiple vortex tornado. Uh, the path is getting larger. You can see that it's uh, really starting to rip and rip. Um, and there's other vortices kind of blending. Here's another view of the same thing. So you start out with this diffuse vorticity. You can tell there's rotation going on here on a large scale, but you can also see how it's sort of aggregating. Uh, vortices tend to grow from the bottom up. Um, some of them just start to flare up almost, almost instantaneously, and this is going to be the tornado. It's not a tornado yet. Um, at some point, it reaches tornado strength. There's one vortex merger. This guy just gets assimilated into the tor developing tornado. And the next vortex merger is really super cool, and I'll focus on that a little later. This one really gets the tornado going. And uh, there's a couple more going, but it's basically aggregation of vorticity. And once the tornado really gets going, it seems to lock into a mode that just is self-sustaining. So there's definitely positive feedbacks going on within the simulation. And this is what we're going to be drilling down into. This is what Kelton's working on for his thesis. This is what uh, is really uh, where we're getting into. Here I'm, I'm showing Vapor, uh, another, again, more volume rendering. This time I'm showing the different color maps. So, so Vapor has the capability. Um, this is just giving you the numerical values that match the different colors. And it's also a slightly different view. So I'm also trying to show diffuse vorticity along with the, the, the vortices. You'll see the paths that they're taking. And the path data is saved in the NetCDF file. This is something I, I worked uh, for my data format. Here's where you start to see the vortices that are moving towards the left start to stop moving towards the left. And instead of moving towards the left, they just start to aggregate and then start to uh, form a tornado. This sort of thing that comes sweeps up behind the tornado is, is associated with the streamwise vorticity current that I mentioned earlier. I published one paper on that. Uh, it, it seems to help to lower the pressure near the ground and, and, the, and the updraft strength near the ground that helps to enable the tornado. And this guy over here to the left does ultimately eventually merge with the tornado. I don't go out that far in this animation. But it's really interesting. You've got all these vortex paths. You can see where they're going. You can see how they're developing vertically. And here's the time here. This is 0.2 second data. Um, by the way, when I did the simulation, it took about 20 restarts on Blue Waters, and every run I did over a 48-hour period, there's like four hardware failures. They just happen when you're running on 78% of the machine. So my, my PBS script that, that runs the model will automatically go back to the last checkpoint file and restart the model so that I can use up my, all my time. That took a little bit of help from the NCSA folks to understand how to do that. But um, so this simulation was painful. It took like three solid weeks of actual time on the machine, but it was split up over a couple months. Um, so it, it looks really nice, and you're only seeing a tiny little piece of the full domain. So you know, I, I really drill down from the very large to the very small. Here's yet another color map. Again, I'm, I'm actually red-green colorblind, so you might think some of my color maps are weird, but uh, I do what works for me. And you know, here I'm really focusing on uh, the yellow paths here, the vorticity associated with these surface vortices. You can sort of see how the, you know, this, is, this is not going to merge, but eventually will, but not in this sequence. The tornado is going to form right about here. You see these, this parade of vortices that's moving from, from right to left just sort of stops and starts to pile up. And there is the SVC air here, so you can see that bundle of vorticity sweeping behind the tornado up into the mesocyclone is, uh, at least in our 30 meter resolutions, this is pretty much the smoking gun um, of what maintains that super strong updraft that helps to maintain the tornado. So when you look at the terms in the vorticity equation for, uh, for growth of vertical vorticity, there's a term called the, the stretching term. And essentially, it's related to the updraft, DWDZ, basically, you know, how strong uh, the updraft is increasing with height. And you have just ridiculously large values of that in, in the updraft uh, before the tornado forms. This is looking at the just zeta, just the vertical component of vorticity. So the blue guys are, are anticyclonic, and the, and the yellow and red guys are cyclonic. So sometimes you'll see some pretty significant, strong anticyclonic vortices. In fact, there's an anticyclonic tornado in this simulation off to the left that I'm not showing you. Um, so that's a fascinating thing as well. Um, those tornadoes have been seen in nature, and in the simulations, they occur right where they should be. Um, you sort of have this vortex couplet that occurs where the tornado's on one side and the anticyclonic one's on the other. Um, so, so anyway, yep, here we go again. You're seeing the same thing in different views, different color maps. There's the tornado. Notice how the path sort of turns to the left. 
Uh, that's as this, this pressure gradient gets super strong and then vorticity just piles up into a tornado. The nifty thing about our hypothesis on tornado formation and maintenance is that it's the same force. It's the same thing. Um, the leading theory of tornado formation is that it requires a proximate downdraft to bring vorticity to the ground and converge it into the tornado. You don't have that happening in the simulation, and that hypothesis, that theory does not account for the maintenance of tornadoes. It, our theory pretty much accounts for both, or our hypothesis. So this is one of my favorite sequences. I'm looking from the above down, and I'm focusing only on large values of vorticity. And you're going to see something really interesting happening here. So notice, you've seen this several times before. The, the tornado is going to form right over here, and it's going to sort of grow from the ground up. And the vortices are going to sort of slow down and just start to pile up. But what you'll see happening aloft is really fascinating. And I'm, I'm sure it's never been seen before. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to detect this sort of thing in nature. But here's our developing tornado. It's turning to the left. There's a vortex merger right there. This guy sort of wraps up into that thing. It's getting stronger. There's another vortex merger right here. And this is the sequence that blows my mind. Watch what happens as this vortex right here sort of interacts with the tornado. It just wraps into it. And I'm going to show you that sequence again because it's so cool. <laughs> um, but I'll let this go a little further. So this is focusing on large values of vorticity. Again, you have this option with vapor. You just choose where you're uh, where your minimum and maximum values are, you choose your opacity curve, etc. But now this thing's just a bundle of vorticity. Now watch this vortex wrap into this vortex. Um, that has never been seen before as far as I know. And after this happens, the tornado just really starts to, to get strong. So it's a, it's a vortex uh, aggregation or merging process that's happening during tornado genesis and during the maintenance of a tornado. You see dozens and dozens of these vortices that merge into a tornado. And these are vortices that are, um, you probably wouldn't see more than a bit of dust being kicked up on the ground if you were actually out in the field. So um, you, you need to do high resolution simulations to get this sort of thing to happen. So let me conclude now. Um, Vapor 3, which made all these lovely images, has been an extremely useful, almost invaluable tool in my research on tornadoes. Um, the ability to read these CF compliant net CDF files is, has been huge for me. It just takes out a huge headache that I had to contend with um, to convert the data into something that Vapor could read. Um, I'll, I, I didn't talk too much about, I showed you a little bit of use of Vapor. It's, uh, the volume render and the ISIS surface render is, is a noticeable improvement over the version 2. And I'm still working with the Vapor guys on this, and I look forward to continuing working with them to fix some performance issues, mostly with I.O. I have some ideas on this, but um, it's, it's, it's been great. So thanks NCAR, thanks John Klein and his group, and uh, thanks NCSA and thanks NSF for supporting my work. And I'll just say that uh, this work has been supported by a whole lot of people. Um, here's a list of my collaborators, and here's a list of the NSF grants that support me, along with the Cooperative Institute at UW-Madison and SSCC. And um, I will post this talk onto my website um, after this, when I get home back in Madison, if you want to see this stuff again. So be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. OK, well, I get to the questions back here. Neil. Hi, thanks. I, I think Vapor looks super cool. Um, so yesterday I, I sort of talked about advocating for this move to thin clients, so having a web page that interacts with some software, and I, and I guess that that's not the model we've been working at the minute. So I wonder if there's been any kind of thinking about maybe the next generation of paper, or whether this is something you can decouple the kind of way you interact with a, sort of a web interface and totally there are a back end that you render for you. I will say that I know that they're working on off-screen rendering. Um, I still think that you'll have to, you know, what I do sometimes with, with Vapor is I use X11 VNC to sort of expose my desktop from, say, home, and then I can access hardware. But thin, yeah, so I use VNCs a lot. So it's sort of a kludge to what you're saying with a, with a thin client, but you can still do it um, so long as you have access to the actual hardware. I'm using an NVIDIA, NVIDIA GTX, uh, pretty high-end, high uh, souped-up GPU, because that's where you get the performance. So I think what you're saying is, um, could you like dynamically script stuff out and things like that? I think that is doable, but maybe not in, in a most elegant way. But using VNCs, I can use Vapor. There's latency issues and things like that. But um, that's more of a, of a question for John. But um, definitely, uh, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll mention it to him and, and see what he has to say.
very uh, short question. So um, in your simulation, what was the assumption you made about the terrain? Um, you know, how smooth was the terrain? There ain't no terrain. It's flat and it's free slip. And I know, and this is an issue, the surface boundary condition with these models is something that we know is wrong. Everybody's doing it wrong. We're all just doing it wrong in different ways. And there's literally papers that are just coming out that are talking about the, the influence of this. And we're looking at this too. Some of the assumptions about like logarithmic boundary layers are completely just wrong when it comes to tornadoes. I mean, what's the, what's the boundary layer of tornado inflow? It's about three feet. I mean, literally. So a lot of, if you turn friction on, and we've done work with friction, and at some point we'll put terrain in, literally start putting buildings and trees in. That, that's, that's the right way to do it. But the whole issue with the surface boundary condition is a well-known problem. Some of the brightest minds that I know are working on this right now. But we, when I, to get this to work, I started stripping away complexity. And one of the things I did at some point was just to turn friction off. So our surface boundary condition is called zero surface strain. Um, George Bryan now does what's called zero surface strain gradient to do the proper version of the free slip. It's kind of weird and, you know, there's different ways of doing it, but essentially, <laughs> to answer your question, there ain't no terrain, the earth is flat, and there's basically no friction. So, but it works. Uh, you may, may have answered my question, but I was wondering if there were other LDS models that could be applied in addition to CM1. Such as maybe the whole war. Um, I'll tell you this. Back a long time ago, before I even knew a CM1, I thought Wharf was going to be the solution to all my problems. This was back in the day where you, ha you had to run the idealized version of Wharf in serial first. And I'm trying to throw like, you know, half a billion grid points on it, and it just fell on the ground. Wharf, in my opinion, is really not meant to do idealized work. It's really meant to do operational work from using analysis files. So. If there's any other models out there, I know that NCAR has something called Fast Eddy that's being developed, and it's and that's something that's I don't think it's got it's GPU, which is really cool, and I'm going I've already talked to those guys about maybe working with them. I don't know that it has moist microphysics and stuff in it yet, but um, CM1 has is really George Bryan has done the, the severe storms community a huge service by putting his code out there. In my opinion, it's the best model out there. Period. I could list other models that people use, but I don't think they're as good as CM1. So. I won't even bother to mention them. Last question. So thank you for the talk. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, it still helps our capacity to, to forecast tornadoes, location, and intensity. Uh, have you ever thought about the, the observational network that would be needed to enable that? It's something that is almost beyond my capability because we literally would have to sweep through the air volumetrically on the order of tens of meters to to feed, in my opinion, to, so you don't have a garbage in, garbage out issue. Because this is highly idealized. I'm starting out with a horizontally homogeneous base state and perturbing, perturbing the atmosphere to grow an updraft. To, the initialization issue is huge. Uh, I work at a place that develops routines for satellites and, and you know, develops hardware for satellites. Satellites probably can't cut it you, you know, necessarily. You can't see down to the ground well enough. Radars don't see everything, and they certainly don't see temperature and pressure and things like that. So the observational network is almost beyond my comprehension. It's going to take a whole lot of technology and a whole lot of infrastructure in order for us to be able to uh, feed our models data that is of high enough fidelity to make those kinds of forecasts. And I think rather what we'll end up doing is more probabilistic statistical things. We need to run ensembles, say, at 30 meters. And hopefully we'll at least the, the, the mean of the ensemble will be reasonable or something, and we can give better probabilistic forecasts. But I'm not entirely convinced in my lifetime we'll be able to predict a half hour in advance that a tornado is going to go down this block or it's going to be of this strength. That's like, you know, that's sci-fi to me almost. So it's, it's a very challenging problem. And as a guy who does modeling, I think we should be focused. And a there are people going to build supercomputers. We don't have to worry about that. I wish we could develop more resources into observational networks because that's what we need to do to, to solve this problem. Okay, let's thank our speaker for his time.